Well, good morning. Um, glad to be here with you. It's been, yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> Worship was really great. Uh, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Sheena. Um, I'm looking forward to more afterwards, so it's exciting. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, not feeling so great. I've had a headache for like three and a half days, and I usually don't get headaches at all. So those of you that live with headaches more regularly, I have so much empathy all of the sudden for you regular headache sufferers. But um, yeah, I've prayed. I've been prayed for. I've been swallowing stuff. Uh, during worship, someone like tapped me and uh, handed me some uh, paracetamol. So I, I took one. Not the best like life skill or ha- if someone hands you pills, like you shouldn't usually take them. But um, uh, I feel like we're in a safe place. And so um, I did it. And so, um, yeah, I'll just... Uh, I'll do what I can. And uh, if it stops making sense, just, just play some more worship music. And just, you know, like uh, at those award speeches when they just start playing the music, which means like your, your thank you speech is over. Um, just do that. Um, OK, so it's October 27th, uh, which means that it is the last Sunday of October, uh, which means that today, just like every Sunday in October, um, we're going to be looking at um, some of the main slogans or the main uh, emphases of a period of European church history called the Reformation. Um, But I hope that today, just like the other days, um, that we're not just getting together to just celebrate the good old days. Um, I mean, for two reasons. I mean, on the one hand, the reality is those days weren't all good. Um, It was a a messy period of history. Um, There were some great triumphs. Uh, There was a lot of confusion. There was some sin. There was violence. Um, But out of that period, um, there were some great uh, truths, uh, some, some biblical principles that had kind of been obscured or muddled And it was great that they were able to rise to prominence uh, once again. And so we've chosen October uh, 2017 to to look back um, at those five kind of slogans or teachings uh, that emerged from there. Uh, And the reason why is because a lot of historians would look at um, October 31st, uh, 1517, as kind of uh, the the spark that started uh, the Reformation. I've mentioned this a few different times, but um, that was the day when a a young German monk, um, who was also a a college lecturer, um, just kind of realized that he wasn't so sure about all the practices of his parish and his church, particularly indulgences. He just says, like, I don't really see this. I don't see indulgences in this book. And um, he posted kind of 95 questions or objections or theses that he was looking to debate somebody on. Um, Again, he was a university lecturer. It was a college town. He was like, surely there's somebody in the seminary or uh, on the priesthood or the upper ups, the bishops, whatever. Somebody can explain this to me or somebody we can kind of have uh, a back and forth debate about this. Um, I know that there are University UCC lecturers, you know, here in Calvary Cork, and there's people that work for the university. I know for a fact, because I've seen it, uh, you guys have a lot of, like, inner department dialogue, um, email lists and and CCs that go to everybody um, all at once. Um, So Martin expected this to be kind of an inner university discussion, that he he actually wrote it in Latin because he's like, this is kind of like a, um, a Latin speaker's thing. It's for the educated. Uh, but something took place. It was as if somebody took one of your private emails and it just went viral. And and you kind of listed a a bunch of um, objections or problems with your department, and then someone just hits reply all and forwards it to everybody. And then if it gets translated into different languages, and then it gets printed and passed around Europe, um, that's kind of what took place, uh, and that's kind of what started uh, the Reformation. It was distributed far and wide, and the ideas that were contained in, in those lists of grievances, and then also the subsequent um, thinking, um, really impacted, um, yeah, um, Europe and the world. It caused people uh, to look back to the Bible itself, to, to ask that important question of what are we being taught and what do I believe, and does it come from God or is it a tradition of men? 
Um, and so October 31st is coming, and uh, I know, you know, people are excited for like the party upstairs. I'm excited for the 500th anniversary of that famous um, trick-or-treater who went to the door of the Wittenberg Church and knocked on the door and, and nailed those theses to it. But I hope that today, and I hope the month of October, has not just been this kind of um, commemoration of 95 theses that were nailed to a wooden door. I hope that today and this whole month has ultimately been a celebration of a man who was nailed to a wooden cross. Uh, because ultimately, um, that's of any value at all if it's pointing back towards that crucified man. If we're able to take off the blinders of tradition and see him for who he really, truly is. And so, um, yeah, those five kind of statements that we've been looking at, um, they all are alone statements. Hold on a second. And they're all over my notes. That's okay. I'm feeling sharp today. So, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So we've we've looked at. I, I kind of forget the order, but yeah, sola scriptura. Uh, the idea that the Bible and the Bible alone is our final and authoritative um, word. And you know what? Even that itself points towards uh, the glory of God, because if this is God's word. That means only God. Is, is trustworthy enough for us to, to bet everything on what he says. Uh, we looked at, uh, at grace alone. And, and if grace alone is true, if we are saved by God's grace alone, and we are, it means that we cannot look to ourselves and to our worthiness or our merit. Um, likewise, sola fide, faith alone. If, if we benefit from the grace of God by faith alone, and we do, uh, that means that we cannot look to our works or to our righteousness, or to our performance as what makes us right before God. So it's pointing us towards God, that God in an act of sheer mercy counts our faith as righteousness. Uh, last week we looked at solus Christus, uh, and that we, we celebrated, we remembered that, that man who was nailed to a wooden cross. Um, God the Son come down to, as one of us to, to rescue us, and just that, that idea of we can't save ourselves. God has to save us. And so that points and gives glory to God. And so our final and fifth um, Sunday, we're looking at sola dio gloria, which means glory to God alone. But I think each and every one of those other ones also points us towards the fact that God alone is worthy of our glory, our worship, our adoration, and our thanks. And so today we're looking at the glory of God alone. And we're going to be looking at um, Isaiah chapter 6. So Audrey read it, and if you have your Bibles open to Isaiah 6, good job. Um, if not, you can look it up in your phone or act like you haven't memorized. Oh, yeah, there it is, yes. Um, uh, yeah, because Isaiah 6, what we see there is uh, a man by the name of Isaiah, uh, a, a young man. Uh, he starts having kids in the next chapter, so probably in his 20s, maybe early 30s, um, and, and he is a, a prophet of God, and, and he has, you know, six chapters in <laughs> to his ministry, he has this encounter uh, with God, he experiences the glory of God in such a way that it that changed him forever. And so I'm going to pray, and then we can look to see what we can learn about the glory of God from uh, this encounter that the young prophet Isaiah had. So Pray with me. So, Father, we, we sing about your glory. Um, I think for those of us that know you, we might have this kind of inarticulate experience of, of experiencing some of your glory. Um, but I pray that this morning, as we look to sacred scripture, that, that you would even just show us a little bit more. Help us to understand and experience um, you in your glory, dear God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Isaiah 6. Um, kind of the first thought is uh, we see Isaiah encountering the glorious God. And so allow me to read uh, verses 1 to 4. You've heard it before, but let me, let me read it again. And we're going to see Isaiah encountering the glorious God.
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And they called out to each other. And they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the whole house was full of smoke. So in there, we see Isaiah encountering the glorious God. Um, He gives us kind of a time stamp. Uh, The time stamp is that uh, this was the year that King Uzziah died. Um, And that doesn't mean much to you and I. And we're not going to get into the the huge whole details because the main focus here is going to be the glory of God, not who was King Uzziah. But let me just briefly just say, he was a good king. And he was kind of like one of, the, one of the few, one of the good ones. And, and, he, and Israel did well under his leadership. Um, it was a time of, um, of national renewal and stability. There was a great kind of sense of um, security. Uh, there was no enemies attacking them. And they were doing kind of well, like financially and economically. If you can remember back to the, the Celtic tiger, um, during the reign of King Uzziah, it was like the Hebrew tiger. Um, and they were doing good. And upon his death, it kind of um, signifies this downturn that's going to go not to a time of austerity, but a time of everything being far, far worse. So the king is dead, and the nation goes into a nosedive. And so it's, it's kind of a bad time. And during that year, that's when Isaiah says, saw the Lord. He had this vision. And in the midst of these days, that's when he has this encounter with the glorious God. I think it's important that it happened at that time for two different reasons. Again, um, Isaiah uh, chapter 6, it's the beginning of the book. It's, it's, it's in fact the longest book in the whole Bible. Uh, The Psalms has more chapter divisions, but as far as words and verses, Isaiah is the longest one. And so from chapter 6, it kind of goes downhill from there. Um, Nationally, things are bad. I think it's important that in the middle of, at the beginning of, rather, Isaiah's um, personal ministry, that he has this personal commission into ministry from God himself. Um, Isaiah is going to be an unpopular guy for a long period of time. Decades are going to go by where nobody listens, nor respects, uh, nor gives heed to what Isaiah says. He won't be believed. He won't be appreciated. And then there at the beginning of his ministry, he is reminded that he is serving people not for earthly applause. He's not doing it for pats on the back. He's not doing it for the glory of his own reputation. But he is commissioned into ministry uh, in such a way that he knows that it's God himself who's calling him and that he's serving for the glory of God alone. Not for pats on the back for Isaiah, but for that God to be honored on the earth. So for him, before he gets ready for decades of unappreciated service, to know that it's, it's God and God alone who called me and it's God and God alone whom I'm accountable to. And that's a, that's, he's, account, he's accountable to him in the sense that I want to, to impress God and God alone. And that's one thing. But then also, let's remember, the nation is about to go into this nosedive. It already had started by chapter 6. The nation of Israel needs to be reminded that God is on the throne. Um, over the next years, things are going to go from bad to worse for them. You know, they're experiencing kind of like financial problems uh, at this stage, but they're gonna come, there's going to come a time when they fondly recalled when all they worried about was money, um, when that was the least of their worries eventually. Um, eventually, the book ends with them being defeated, displaced, and discouraged. But how important it is for the faithful remnant amongst the displaced nation to know that God is still on the throne. That the vision that Isaiah has of God is not God pacing back and forth in the hallways of heaven. Um, That it's not God wringing 
his holy hands, saying, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? That he's not wiping nervous sweat off of his holy um, forehead, but that he is on the throne, that he is in charge, and that he is holy and glorious, that, that he is working all things together for good for those that love him. And so that's important for Isaiah, about to begin an unpopular ministry, and Israel, about to go through a very hard time. That's not the main point, but I just feel maybe some of us need to hear that, that we, we serve God and God alone. We look for his approval and his alone. And then also, even in the midst of dark and worsening times, that God is not wringing his hands. He is on the throne. Just a bonus, okay? Now, main point. <laughs> the main point is that God is on display in this passage as glorious. Remember, Isaiah encounters the glorious God. Glory is a concept that a lot of church folk a lot of us that have been going to church for, for uh, a good while or even just a, a week or two, we've heard the word glory before. In fact, it's kind of a word that we only say in these kind of contexts. Um, sometimes I love how ordinary the Bible's language is, where it takes just kind of normal words and kind of imbues them with special significance. But sometimes there's words that, that kind of only are restricted to, to Bible stuff. Or, and, and holy is kind of one of them. Um, sorry, glory. Glory is one of them. You know, I've I, I known people from like the American South, and uh, I've known some of them, and, and they would use the word glory a little bit more than we would. Something would excite them, and they'd be like, glory. <laughs> um, but it hasn't really caught on in Cork. <laughs> so we don't really use the word glory uh, very often. Maybe for like an amazing sunset, we'd be like, man, that sunset was glorious, you know? So it's like we, we only use it for kind of like Christianity stuff, church stuff, and like really nice sunsets. Um, but, but what is there beyond that? Like what does glory mean? Um, C.S. Lewis, um, he wrote a book, or it's actually kind of an essay, and it's called The Weight of Glory. And uh, it's, it's a good little essay. I, I recommend it. And I love his honesty at the beginning where he says, you know what, guys? Like, I don't really know what glory is. And you're like, I just downloaded this book, and, and uh, I'm supposed to read from you. And you begin by saying you don't know what it is. Um, he, he is saying that in his mind, or it used to be anyway, that when he would think about glory, he'd think of either one or two things. He'd think of somebody who's very, very famous, somebody that people are kind of clamoring to get an autograph from or to take a selfie with or something. He'd say, that's, that's glory. They didn't do selfies back then, but autograph. Like, that's glory. To be really famous, that must be glory. And then he also said that he got it into his head somehow that glory meant glowing and that glorious things were kind of glowing things, hence sunsets. Um, but uh, he says, you know what, like there is a degree of fame, um, of appreciation that goes along with glory. And then also we see from time to time, we do see even kind of light emanating uh, from the Lord or even think of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, there, there is light emanating from him. But he goes on to say that it's far more than just being famous or glowing in the dark, um, that glory is something else. And he, he points out um, that the book is called The Weight of Glory. He points out that the word translated glory in the Old Testament, it's kabod or kavod. Um, and it means, quite literally, does anyone know? Weight. I gave you a hint earlier. The weight of glory. Kabod or kabod, I'm going to mispronounce it, but you don't know anyway, so that's fine. Um, it, means, it means weight. It, it means heaviness. And he says that that kind of helped him and maybe will help us to understand a little bit about um, glory, that it, it, it literally means weight. And so that has slipped into our language sometimes. When we talk about something that's ultimately serious, we say, you know, man, that's, I have some heavy news for you. Or there's a, a weightiness associated with a certain thing. Or if you want to be fancy, you talk about how a certain character or a certain word has gravitas to it. All of that means that it's, it's heavy and that it's weighty and that it's important. So that's maybe some of it. The, the holiness, sorry, the, the glory of God has to do with the importance, the, the gravity of that. But then here, as we look back at our passage, um, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, the lyrics of the song that the angels are singing. Maybe that's another clue. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
And the second part is, the whole earth is full of his glory. So the first thing has to do with something to do with God himself. God is the thrice, the thrice holy God. He is holy, holy, holy. And that's who he is. And then it says that the earth is filled with his glory. And so perhaps the inside nature of God, complete holiness, the thrice holy God, when that holiness is on display, when it comes out to the world, that's called glory. So when God's holiness and when God's goodness goes public, that's called the glory of God. Um, we might think about the, the best part of something or somebody as being their glory. You know, you might, you might think of a flower and say, well, well, the glory of a flower is its beauty. Um, there's a passage in Jeremiah that speaks about um, the glory of a strong man is his strength, Jeremiah 9, 23. The glory of God is his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of God. The earth is full of his glory. And then, or also the glory of God is his goodness. We haven't time for it, but just check out Ezekiel, um, Exodus 33 and 34, because there Moses asks God, would you show me your glory? And, and God's answer, maybe some of you know this, he says, you know what, I can't show you my glory, but I'm going to allow my goodness to pass by you. And so that inward attribute of God expressed out in the world is called the glory. So it's hard for us to describe for sure, but it's, it's kind of like the best of God. And even I'm uncomfortable using the word best because that would imply that there's sometimes degrees of goodness. But it's, it's the in, inward attributes of God on display. Maybe that's, that's, his, that's glory. That's some of what we mean when we say the glory of God. Um, here we see the angels in verse 3. They're declaring the glory of God. And then we heard Sheena read from Psalm uh, 19 that says famously that the heavens declare the glory of God. That there is this way of just emanating or showing forth some of who God is, either with words or silently. But then we see in verse uh, 4 and following, or verse 5 and following, Isaiah himself wants to glorify God. He wants to declare the glory of God, but he realizes there's a problem. So he hears the angels. He's like, I want to get in on this. How can I declare the glory of God as well too? But in verse 5 and following, he realizes, I can't. And so moving on to our next section. So firstly, we saw that, um, that we, he encounters the glorious God. And then now we see that he discovers that there's a way for inglorious people to come to a glorious God. He realizes that he can't just, just saunter up before him. Uh, verse 5, read it with me. Sorry, that was... Verse 5, would you please read it with me? <laughs> I'm not at my best, guys. I'm not. So I said, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Um, so he encounters God's holiness, and he is reminded of his unholiness. He says, my, my lips are unclean. He says, more than that, he says, it's, it's my people that are unclean. He says, you know, I'm, I'm far more comfortable in unholy circumstances than I am right now. He's like, I, there's, there's part of me that just kind of wants to go back because I'm, I fit better there. I don't fit good here. My lips are unclean. And, and that's kind of his, his protestation. That's him saying, like, we're, we're incompatible, you and I. But then he finds out that there's a way for inglorious people to come before a glorious God. He confessed his sin. He was cleansed. And then he was commissioned. Again, he says, my, my lips are unclean. And, and so then there's the angel that comes and... and I'll read the passage. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So again, I, Isaiah knew the incompatibility between the glorious and holy God 
and himself with unclean lips. And although it hadn't been written yet, he certainly would agree with what Romans 3.23 says, where it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isaiah essentially says, I fall short of your glory, God. We're incompatible. I fall short. And God makes a way for him to be cleansed and then welcomed in. And, and here we have this, again, this admittedly, this unusual uh, vision that he has had or this encounter that he has. But, you know, it really fits in with a lot that we see in the Old Testament. And it, it's the story of God acknowledging the incompatibility between glorious God and inglorious people, and then God making ways for sin to be dealt with so that fellowship could be had. And we, we see that perhaps, you know, most famously, I suppose, in the, the Old Testament prescription and tradition of animal sacrifice, as there would be, and the kids are learning about this upstairs right now, um, you can ask the kids, um, where there would be a confession of sins, even over the head of a sacrificial lamb or a dove or a goat. And then that lamb or dove or goat, that would in essence die in your place so that you could go on having fellowship with God. There's a substitutionary sacrifice that's taken place. So it's this kind of old, one of the Old Testament previews, I suppose, of the way that God is going to allow people with unclean lips and hands uh, to come before him. You know, Isaiah, he had this, this payment or this, this cleansing um, that was commissioning, like, let's say, him and him alone for this ministry. Uh, there was these Old Testament sacrifices that were, by nature, they were temporary. By nature, they were almost placeholders looking forward to a greater day when a greater act of atonement and a greater act of forgiveness would take place. Um, Isaiah says, you know, I'm, I'm unclean. And an angel comes with coal and cleanses the part that he confesses. That's not permanent. That's not once and for all. But something is going to take place that will be. And it's not going to be performed by an angel. It's not going to be performed by placing a coal on a man's lips. It involves the same Lord of glory that's seated upon that throne, described in Isaiah 6, stepping off that throne and coming down to live among Isaiah's people, to live among people of unclean lips and hands and eyes and head and shoulders and knees and toes and eyes and ears and mouth and nose, um, that, that the Lord of glory comes down off of his throne and then lives amongst them. And his name is Jesus. In, in John chapter 12, Jesus refers to Isaiah 6 and says, do you guys know that passage? Isaiah wrote that because he saw my glory. So he definitely is claiming, he's like, yeah, I'm the one on the throne. And then here I am now living amongst people of unclean lips. And he comes and he lives among us. And instead of him being defiled or unclean, he remains clean and then offers himself as a sacrifice. He dies, he rises. And then those that place their trust in him and him alone, well, the same thing is spoken to them as is spoken to Isaiah. So Christian, hear this. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, not with the, the ash from a hot coal, but with the blood of Jesus Christ. Christian, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. God makes a way for inglorious people to come to him. The Old Testament shadows are varied. I, I, I mentioned the sacrificial system. Um, there's another way, I guess, that whole, the whole tabernacle, the tent in the wilderness, that place where it says that the glory of God at times would, would appear. It was a place of sacrifice, and it was a place of glory. It was called the tabernacle. And in the New Testament, as Jesus arrives, it says in John 1, 12, it says that all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And listen to this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Uh, that, that old tent, that tabernacle system was a place where glory dwelt, a place where sacrifice was made, 
and it was covered in skin. It looked ordinary on the outside, but the glory of God was inside. When it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word there is tabernacled among us. God set a tent up and dwelt among us, that place of glory, that place of sacrifice, and it's all found in Jesus. So there is a way for inglorious people to come to glorious God, and it's through Christ alone. And so thirdly, finally, we are commissioned to enjoy and spread the glory of God throughout the earth. And that's what we see with um, Isaiah here. So he is cleansed. It says there that your, his guilt is taken away. His sin is atoned for. And then Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. And then he says, go and say to this people. And then there's quite a, a lengthy commission and, and we're not going to get into the content of uh, what he was told. I mean, just read the, the other 60 books of Isaiah and you can find out a little bit more uh, about that. But after he experiences or encounters the glorious God, after God made a way for inglorious Isaiah to come and be in relationship with him, the third and final thing is that he commissions him to enjoy and to spread the glory of God throughout the earth, to, to take what he saw there, what he heard there, and bring it to his people and, and bring it to the ends of the earth. So, guys, I, I don't know, like, glory, it's hopefully I make it a little bit more concrete, but at the same time, it's a big concept. It's, it's, it's massive. It's, it's used, the word glory is in the Bible 536 times, so there's no way that kind of a, a brief talk from a sick man <laughs> is going to at all kind of encompass it, but hopefully we have a little bit of kind of a handle of, of what this is. But it also means that, that one aspect of this is that we're able to um, work that we're able to serve, that we're able to live in such a way that we point towards that glory. Uh, think of what Jesus himself said. He says, um, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So this is maybe taking it from this very big abstract concept of, of this weight uh, this, this idea of the glory of God, we're also, where the way that we, let's say, even perform at, at work tomorrow could give someone an opportunity to give glory to God, to be like, wow, I, I see something of the, the goodness or the holiness of God um, in the way that you filled out those forms, uh, in the way that you fed that kid, uh, in the way that you cleaned that up or that you organized that or the way that you did not complain about that. Colossians 3 says that whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the inheritance as your reward, for you are serving the Lord Christ. Um, this is something that um, Johann Sebastian Bach seems to have gotten, um, the composer, as everyone knows. Um, <laughs> I had to look him up earlier this week, so I, <laughs> I'm not as cultured as, uh, as I might pretend sometimes. Um, but, you know, he, he wrote like 500 um, pieces. Um, every single one, there's kind of like initials at the top that would say in, in, in Latin, you know, Jesus, help. Just asking, a, a writing a little silent prayer, Jesus, would you help me? And then he just writes this masterpiece. And then at the end of each one, he'd write SDG, which stands for Sola Deo Gloria. So he wrote out, I suppose, what could be for us just a very, a very silent prayer before every task, you know, Jesus, help. And then at the end, you know, to God alone be the glory. And there is something about that that just frees us, I guess, from the temptations to, to pride or to, to sense of accomplishment or performance to say, that was really good. I'm, I'm doing pretty great. We can say, you know what? If I'm able to perform it well, it's because God has made me, created me, and Jesus has helped me. So I'm able to say, sola dio gloria. I mean, the opposite of that is sola mio gloria. And that's kind of the deep. I thought that was really funny. 
sola mio gloria, get it? So the opposite of sola dio gloria, glory to God alone, kind of a default um, of our hearts is sola mio gloria, you know, that, that yeah, it was good, and, and would you give me the weightiness of it all? Would you, you know, lavish praise upon me? But there is such a way we can say, you know what, I want my good works to be seen by men so that they can glorify my Father in heaven. So there's ways for, to parent. There's ways to be friends that, that point people towards the glory of God. And, and then even you might say, okay, well, it's easy enough for Johann Sebastian Bach to give glory to God. He wrote these like, you know, famous pieces of music. Um, but did you know, it doesn't have to just be something great. It doesn't have to be as we, we finish, you know, this skyscraper and say, to the glory of God, you know, or we complete this project and say, to the glory of God. Did you know that Paul said that we could do all things? I love what 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether we eat or whether we drink, to do all things to the glory of God. There's ways of eating and drinking that can bring glory to God. If it's, if it's rendang curry, um, if it is, um, which is the obvious way to give glory to God by you, <laughs> um, or, or whether it's like the fanciest of meals that we're eating in, in fellowship with lots of kind of friends and family, and you just, you're just, man, I'm glorifying God as I'm doing this. Or if it's, if it's you know, just cheap noodles alone in, in, in your you know, corner office because you have to eat in 10 minutes and get back to work. You, you can do that in such a way to even glorify God, to say, God, I, I thank you for this. You know, I, I enjoy this or, I, or even I don't enjoy this, but thank you so much that, that I'm alive and that I can eat. And, you know, a prayer that I, I, I've been trying to pray for years, every time I eat, um, whether I say it out loud or not, I try to think, you know, God, thank you for this food. This food is going to keep me alive for a little bit longer. And I pray that the energy from this food will help me to glorify you, that I can burn these calories um, in a way that doesn't bring glory to me, that doesn't cause hurt to others, that is not leading me to sin, but that, that brings glory to you. So I commend, I suggest, maybe you could just, a way to honor God and how we eat and drink is to pray and say, God, you know, thank you for this um, water. Actually, this one. I found this one up here. It's probably from Alex. <laughs> I found it up here, so I've been drinking. Lord, thank you for this. May I use this energy and parchment to, to say a good closing prayer, okay? So, in the same way, let your light shine before men so they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. You know, I said that I'd be saying a closing prayer. In fact, actually, I'm not. Um, I'm going to be asking you to close us in prayer. Uh, because as we kind of complete that, that fifth and final sola, um, sola dio gloria, um, I was listening to a, a podcast from RTE um, a couple of days ago, and it was about the Reformation. So, of, of course, I'm <gasps> downloading it and listening to it. And, you know, various kind of scholars and historians were talking about kind of the Irish scene um, during the Reformation and, and the subsequent. And they say that Ireland, it's the nation that the Reformation forgot. Um, it's kind of true. Um, certainly, it, was, um, it changed hearts elsewhere, and, and some people came to try to impose those changes on others, but it didn't really work. Um, and so I would maybe ask us to, to close, maybe in, in a silent prayer and then an out loud prayer. So the silent prayer, we could just pause for a minute and a half, and we could just pray that these kinds of truths, these kinds of truths that scripture alone, that grace and faith alone, that Christ alone and the glory of God alone, that they would find a home in our city, they would find a home in this country, that these would not be foreign concepts, but they can be incarnated and, and lived here. And that's kind of a, a, a prayer that I'm going to ask you maybe to, maybe one or two of you to pray out loud. And then after, and, but before that, I want to ask a private prayer would we pray that these truths, that scripture and grace and faith and Christ and the glory of God alone, that before we pray for our city and our country, that they'd find a home in our own hearts. And so that's a personal thing. And so I'm just going to have 90 seconds of, of quietness, and you can pray that, that this and the other four would just find a home in your hearts. And then I'm going to ask for two people to pray that it would find a home in our city and in our country. So let's, let's quietly pray.